Heather Jaffen. I'm private sector in Fairfax, Virginia. And fascinated by your presentation and your accomplishment. Uh, I would like to ask you, in your own personal or experience, what was the hardest element to, uh, to overcome to achieve governance? I don't know whether there is a, a great difficulty in achieving good governance. I know there is a difficulty in achieving some of the objectives that you promised when you came to office. I said that we are all facing poverty alleviation, for instance, education and training of our people, fighting of disease. We might fail in those. But so long as you use our best endeavors towards that end, we are practicing good governance. But I don't remember anybody opposing education and training or water development in a country which is a, it's a desert anyway, a semi-arid country, or the fight against disease, in our case HIV and AIDS. I don't, I don't remember anybody opposing that. Uh, and so it's a matter of one self wanting to do the right thing. Thank you very, very much for that very candid and enlightening presentation. My name is Howard Jeter, and I'm a former ambassador to Botswana. Um, I wanted to thank you for giving us the, uh, this new TV series, the uh, Ladies Detective Agency. It has taken this country by storm, and you couldn't buy that kind of publicity, but congratulations. <clears throat> I'd like to ask a question about uh, regional integration. And I know that the regional, regional integration, integration in yes. Southern Africa in particular, and I know the very solid and critical role that Botswana has played. But there seems to have been, or well, there seems to be a slowing in terms of regional integration efforts, particularly NAPAD is not as dynamic as it used to be. Thankfully, the East African community is doing well. And it's just such an important issue for the future of Africa. So I'd like to get your assessment of where you think we're going in terms of regional integration. Thank you. Regional integration, in my view, remains an important thing. And the formation and development of regional economic communities as the building blocks for an ultimate African union. It is true that in SADC, in, in the last 10 years, we have not made much progress. Uh, to some extent, we were distracted by s some of the problems in some of the member countries, including the DRC, and uh, ultimately also Zimbabwe, because we began to have summits where we didn't talk about economic integration, about economic issues. We kept on talking politics, talking one thing or the other, and not addressing the economic and social problems of the region as a whole, or even of individual countries. We became preoccupied with dealing with political issues to the detriment of the development uh, and cohesion of, of, of the region. And therefore, SADC has done well, has done less well than ECOWAS and than COMESA. I am hoping that uh, after this series of elections, that may, um, we, we might resume the path towards um, regional integration, which has um, slowed down. Um, 
I think the assumptions of NEPAD remain valid, but as you say, we haven't done as well as we could have done. I hope that when we see the other regions much ahead, maybe we will be challenged to, um, to emulate them. My question is, uh, looking at Africa, um, multiple party and sharing power, does it work in Africa? Because any country that is having multiple party and sharing power is where we have most problems. Is it the leadership that is, does not understand sharing power or they are the people that don't understand multiple party and sharing power? Because this is why we see more conflicts, violence, and just uh, trouble in Africa. How can you tell me about this or tell us about the multiple party and sharing power in Africa? Thank you. There is sharing of power. And therefore, I don't believe that Africans are not capable of sharing power. Yes, I admit there has been a tendency not to be willing to share power, but I think we are going to have to. And we are capable of doing that because in a number of countries, as I say, up to 2022, that is happening and in some of these countries, on a sustainable basis. I have cited Senegal, I have cited Tanzania, I, have, I could cite my own country, I can cite Zambia. Uh, just, just as examples at random. But um, I agree in, in some other countries, it has not yet happened. But it, it will happen. Increasingly, civil society will not allow leaders who want to perpetuate um, themselves forever in power, the problems of the personality cult and, and so on. I think the personality cult is out of fashion and should not be allowed to come back. People should just know that they are leaders for the time being charged with the fortunes of their fellow countrymen. And that even if you are, you know, one gentleman in South Africa has, has created a phrase which I find very telling. He calls it the liberation aristocracy, where people take part in, um, in the liberation struggle against white rule and domination. And then they say, I have liberated you, therefore I am, you are going to be my slaves forever. <laughs> that should not be the case. My name is Chinwei F. Young. I'm with the Discovery Channel Global Education Partnership. And um, my question is, is it fair to really talk about Africa as a homogeneous group of countries when you're talking about governance. Um, I was looking at the countries that you used as examples of successful governance. Um, the population of Botswana is 2 million. Um, of Gambia currently is 1.6 million. Mauritius is 1.2. Senegal is a little bit higher, 12.5. And what would your advice be to countries like Nigeria and Ethiopia with populations of over 50 million? and ethnicities ranging in the 200s of um, distinct ethnic groups, would the same principles of governance that apply to these smaller countries apply to these countries as well? Thank you. If you recall my earlier remarks, my sister, I said it used to be said in the 70s and said that the Gambia is less straightforward nowadays. Then I said there are more than 20 countries where democratic governance or accountable governance is taking place, including Tanzania and Mozambique, including South Africa and Zambia. And their populations are not two million. 
in Tanzania, in Mozambique, in South Africa. And all African countries are characterized by ethnic pluralism. Diversity of ethnic groups. It's true, the problems of each country um, deserve solutions that are unique to that uh, country. But you know what? The Nigerians are managing their ethnic problems. Right now they are. It is not the greatest problem. The greatest problem appears to be, and in recent decades, appears to have, to have been the appropriate utilization of revenues derived from the sale of natural resources. Now, it might well be, of course, one is oversimplifying, it might well be that uh, the ethnic and religious composition has influenced the misallocation of resources that has been observed in the past. But I don't think that the existence of, of ethnic differences or even religious differences per se are themselves a cause of a suboptimal allocation of natural resources or they can prevent a government from developing uh, appropriate um, national priorities for development. Uh, and so I also think that you are not necessarily right in implying, my sister, that it is smaller countries that are more, that have practiced democracy, because as I say, okay, if you take Mauritius and, and Botswana, small countries, but not South Africa, and uh, not, not Mozambique, not Tanzania. In fact, it's often said that the very number of ethnic groups in Tanzania has made it has made it possible for for the language Kiswahili um, to emerge as a national language, because there was not there was no single group uh, that dominated the other. There are, I'm told, over a hundred languages, as there are in Zambia, as there are in Nigeria. Uh, but there it is, they are practicing accountable governance now in, in, in Zambia. Uh, 